joining us on tonight for Bible study. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight comes from Revelation, the 11th chapter and the 17th verse from the New Living Translation. And it reads, and they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was, for now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. We thank God that there is no God like our God. No other small G-O-D compares to our big God. God is in control of the heavens and the earth, and he reigns with wisdom, power, and love. God does not get joy when people die before accepting his son Jesus as their savior. God wants all people to know his power and experience his love. So accept Jesus into your heart today and experience this newness of life that all Christians talk about. This God that we serve is with us and helps us make it through our trials that we face every day. I thank God that I know him and the power of his resurrection. Our song tonight is Awesome God because we know that our God is an awesome God and he reigns in this universe. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We thank you for being the awesome God. We thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. We thank you, Father God, for just being awesome in our lives, for being awesome enough to save us, for being awesome enough to forgive us. We thank you, Father God, for being awesome in us. We thank you, Father God, that the greater one is in us. You are in us. And we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that no power, no principality, no devil in hell can hold us back. And we thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do and the way you do things. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us as we come before your word, that we will understand your word, 
that your word will be made clear, that your Holy Spirit will lead us, guide us, and teach us by way of your word. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, He is the awesome God. Yes, He does. Our God is an awesome God. the awesome and the amazing God. <laughs> he is the awesome God. Regardless of what you do, regardless of who you are, regardless of all the magnificent things you do, you are not awesome because mm -hmm. God is awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is nobody like our awesome God. His name is Jesus the Christ. He is the God in heaven, the great deity, the supreme one himself. And we've come tonight to honor him, to praise him, to lift his holy name, for he is the only one worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. We come again tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We will end chapter 3 if the Lord is willing on tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians. In the New Testament, the book is 1 Thessalonians. The chapter is 3. The last pericope is outlined in verses 11, 12, and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11, 12, and 13 is where we will launch tonight. We're looking at what Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica, these newborn, again, believers, these brand new converts that are struggling. They are struggling in, in persecution. They are struggling to stay on one accord. They are struggling to, to always lift up Jesus, regardless of the pressures that is put upon them, and they're under some major pressure as Paul writes this letter to them. They are, they're under pressure to go back to the old way and forsake Jesus Christ, uh, but Paul writes this letter to them, and, and he sends Timothy to look for them and talk to them and encourage them, and so we end tonight's uh, chapter 3. We end chapter 3 tonight. We bring it to an end in verses 11, 12, and 13. And Paul is constantly reminding the church that we're praying for you. And he's reminding the church to pray for the church. If we're going to make it, we need to be praying for each other. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray for the believers of Jesus Christ. There's persecution and dangers all around us, even as it was during these days. I said to you on Sunday that we are so far in trouble right now, we're so deep in trouble right now, it is not even to be compared. The days, the days of Jim Crow were not as bad as these days. The days of civil rights movement was, was not as bad as these days. Not only is, is a race under attack and racists under attack, the church is under attack. The church is under attack. So people don't want to believe what the word says, and they don't want you to believe what the word says. I also said to you on Sunday, we cannot expect these great United States of America to be holy while we're still legislating sin. We're still voting in sin. We need to make sure that we get back to the old path and walk therein. We have to get back to the old path and walk therein. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13 is where we are. The Apostle Paul brings this chapter to a close by encouraging the saints in prayer. He begins in verse number 11 by saying, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Direct our way to you. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that there are some things that we can do 
But when it talks about direction and talks about getting back to the old fold, and when it talks about getting back into the meeting place with the saints again, Paul understands that the devil is busy. I know it's not news to you, but I want you to know today that the devil is busy. And it, this is a timely word because the devil doesn't want us to get back together again. Look at what God says. The devil doesn't want us to get back together again. Even today, the devil want to give you an excuse. Even today, the devil wants you to forsake the assembly of each other. Even today, the devil wants you to, to not believe that it's time to get back together again. He says, for may our God, our Father, our God, our Father himself, what he's saying to us today is that God, the supreme one, the one who is the divine deity, the one who is God. We want him to be the one to get us back. This, this, this term God here is used with the word ex, exceeding God. It is the word that gives us deity himself. It is this word, God, the deity, the one who is God himself. He is the magistrate. He is the supreme deity. He is supreme in divinity. He's God. Many men are holy. Many men are degreed. Many men have, have matriculated through seminary. But the fact of the matter is, there is no one higher and smarter and more holy than God. He says, now may our God. He he talks about God as a possession of ours. He's our God. No man should come to the conclusion that his God is only his God. He is our God. Those of us who trust Jesus, those of us who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, those of us who have committed to follow Jesus based on what he'd done on Calvary. Let me just share with you, the God that we serve is not just my God, he is our God. Apostle Paul admonished them to recognize him as our God. Not only does he admonish them to recognize him as our God, he admonished them to recognize him as our father, our parent, the one who makes a way for us, the one who does great things for us. We must get to a point in this world, in these United States of America, where we acknowledge God as our father. And whenever you have a father, the father is placed in your life to lead you, to guide you, and to direct you. Regardless of how old we get, Regardless of how, how aged we become, our fathers and our mothers should always be able to speak into our lives. Even at the age of 58, if mama says, sit down, guess what I have to do? I have to sit down. <laughs> if mama said, don't go, I, I have to stop going. So what we have to do is make sure that we obey our father. It says, our God, our Father, himself, we must give attention to him. He says, now may our God and Father, himself, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. This word Lord means controller. This word Lord means that he can give us instructions and we will follow the instructions. This word Lord means that Jesus Christ makes a way out of no way for us. And because he is our Lord, he's able to direct us. He is supreme in authority because he's our Lord. If you are saved, if you're born again, Jesus is your savior. 
But when you follow his principles, Jesus is your Lord. When you're saved, you still have an option whether you want to follow the principles of God. When you're born again, you have an option whether you want to walk with God. But when Jesus is your Savior, you have to also allow him to be your Lord. Is he your Lord today? Is he leading you? Is he guiding you? Are you obeying him? Are you walking according to the principles of Jesus Christ? Is he your controller? Is he your master? This, this word Lord means that he's your controller. He's your master. He's the one that leads you and guides you. And Paul directs this right here in this verse by coming by and saying that not only is he our Lord and he's Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he is the son of God, Yeshua himself. He is the son of God. And the word Christ means he's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. This word Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. Many men have claimed themselves to be anointed. Many men, even today, have claimed themselves to be the Messiah that will take us from this world that we know. But there's only one Messiah. There's only one Christ. And that is Jesus Christ himself. You see, there were a lot of men in biblical days named Jesus. But there was only one Jesus Christ. He is Jesus the Christ. When, when, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Well, who do you say I am? Peter speaks up in Matthew 16. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are Jesus Christ is what he just said. He is the son, this word son, this son of the living God. There's no son of the living God other than Jesus Christ. That's why John in chapter three, verse 16, we all recite it. We all know it. We all repeat it. We all read it. We all claim it as one, one of our favorite scriptures. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This word begotten means unique, unique son. This word begotten means one of a kind son. God so loved the world that he gave his one-of-a-kind son, Jesus the Christ. So Paul says in verse number 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. That's the word direct. I told you that when Jesus Christ is your Lord, he directs your life. When Jesus Christ is your Lord, he guides your life. This word direct means to guide. This word direct means to straighten fully, to straighten out, to straighten fully, to straighten out fully. This word, this word direct means that God will give you a straight path. Paul is praying. Paul is saying that he's trusting Jesus Christ. He's trusting God himself that one day we will have a direct path to you, a direct uh, a straightening to you. The, the prophet Amos talks about that, that one of these days, the crooked places shall be made straight. The hills shall be flattened down. Dr. King used it in his speeches that, that one day the crooked places shall be made straight. Every, every valley shall be exalted. Every hill shall be mowed down and made straight. It'll be a level plain. The Apostle Paul is praying here, and he, he said, Now look, those of you in Thessalonica, y'all hold on. <laughs> Stay with the Lord. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't get fooled. Don't think the green grass is greener on the other side. He's saying, whatever you do, stay with the Lord. Yes. And I'm praying that one of these days, God will make our path, our, our, 
direction straight. Mm -hmm. It will direct us. It will direct our way. And we, we want to be with you one day. Don't you long to be back in church? Don't you long to be back in fellowship? Don't you long to be with those who, who worship God like you worship him? We look forward to the day when we can pack the church out again. We look forward to the day where we don't have to sit on this end of the road and this end of the road and separate families. We look forward to the day that we can fellowship once again. If you are not praying for that day, if you are not praying for that day to hurry up, if you are not praying, then you are not praying. You ought to be praying, Lord, give us that day where when we can come together and fellowship again. The Apostle Paul says to this church at Thessalonica, we are looking forward to the day that our God will direct us back to you and give us a straight way, a straight path back to you. Yeah. Why is he talking about giving us a straight path? You just walk out the door and walk in the other door. Because during this period, there were persecutions. And these persecutions were holding back those who worship God together. There were, signs, there, were, there were times that they had to give signs of, of who wanted to worship together. Mm -hmm. When you drive down the road and you see on the back of the car this fish-shaped, oval-shaped fish with Jesus. Some of them have Jesus in the middle of them. Others have a cross in the middle of it. That was a symbol of some days past when they could not worship freely. So they had to give an indication that they were Christians. So one person would meet the other and they would think that each other's are Christians. So what they would do, one person would make the oval shape on the ground and the other person would make the, the oval shape upside down on the ground, creating a fish type symbol, meaning that we are fishermen of men meaning that we can get together and worship because we worship Jesus Christ together. What if we had to give symbols? What if we could not freely walk in the church without the government coming and locking us up? We can freely worship. We can freely get together. We can freely talk on the phone about Jesus. We can freely send in emails about Jesus. We can freely send text messages about Jesus. And we just won't do it with vigor and excitement. I've told you over and over again how to get rid of telemarketers. The way you get rid of telemarketers is to start telling them about Jesus. Start asking them, are they saved? And introducing them to Christ over the phone. Try it. You'll love it. You will be so proud of yourself when you get off the phone. If you want to get rid of a telemarketer, talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Introduce them to Jesus. And when they try to get off the phone, tell them, no, don't rush away now. I'm not finished talking. First thing they'll tell you is that, well, you know, we can't talk about religion on the phone. Explain to them, this is not a religion I'm talking about. It's a person I'm talking about. And he is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who can save you. He is the one who keeps you. He's the one who clothes you and feeds you. I'm talking about a person, not a thing. I'm talking about a person, not a religion, his name is Jesus. And if they give you enough time, just, just quickly tell them, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. Jesus was buried and, bur and buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus lives today, and he wants to live in you. He wants to be a part of you. He wants to walk with you, lead you, and guide you. He wants to direct you. His name is is Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, if you want to get rid of the guys that's ringing your doorbell, if you want to get rid of the, the ones who walk around on Saturday and, and, and disturb your yard work, stop long enough to tell them about Jesus. And don't let them tell you he's only a prophet. Don't let them tell you he's only a good man. Tell them about Jesus, the Son of God, the only righteous lamb that was slain for you and for me. Tell them that he was the ultimate sacrifice for all mankind. You see, there were animals slain, slain for the sins, but they were not slain for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God that was slain for the entire sins of the world, of the entire world. 
Look at verse number 12. It says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Paul is saying to this church, and you got you got to walk in love. There are too many churchgoers who talk about, I don't love those people. I don't even like those people. And they would even call their names. <laughs> These are members of the church of Jesus Christ. These are people who say they love the Lord. These are people who say they are born again. They will tell you, I don't even like those folks. Don't put me in the room with them. Don't make me work with them. Don't make me have to speak to them. I don't even like them. But the apostle Paul says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. Two words he points out. First of all, he says increase. And the second one he says abound in love. The first word increase means to superabound. This word increase not only means to superabound and to increase, it means to have to overflow, to have abundance of. It means to make more. In other words, as we show our love toward each other, it makes love happen in superabounding motion. What he's saying is, we as Christians ought to get to the point where we love one another. Look what he says, increase and abound in love. You ought to increase and abound in love because when you increase and abound in love, you have super abounding love. You excel in love. You, you overflow in love. That's what ought to be going on in the church. The church ought to love everybody. The church ought not be condemning anybody. Because the church knows just a few days ago, matter of fact, just yesterday, I was them also. Regardless of their sin, you were a sinner also. Let me just say to you, Paul says, I'm praying, and I want you all praying. He's saying that may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. Jesus says in John chapter 13 that they will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. Look how Paul lays it out. Paul says love that abounds, that super abound, it ought to be abounding for one another. It's a sad day when church folk don't love each other. It's a sad church when church folk can't get along. It's a sad day when church folk can't have each other's back. It's a sad day when my child go wrong and you make fun of it. It's a sad day when your child go wrong and I make fun of your child. Let me just say to you, the church of Jesus Christ has to get to a point where they love each other and they show love to each other. For Jesus says that men will know you are my disciples. They will know that you're born again. They will know that you're saved by the love you have one to the other. You ought not just be loving your family members. You ought not just be loving your friends. You ought not just be loving your neighbors that you get along with. You ought to love each other. The church has to get to a point where the church love each other. Winos love each other. Dope dealers love each other. Prostitutes love each other. Why can't the church love each other? Jesus says we will know, people will know that we are Christians. We are disciples by the love we show for each other. Back home, they would say we have love that flows from heart to heart and breast to breast. Mm -hmm. That means we really love each other. We don't like some of the things you do. <laughs> we don't like all the caring out you do. <laughs> we don't like the stuff you act a fool with, but we really love you. Mm -hmm. And we love you to the point where we're going to keep praying, Lord, 
let us get together again. He says, abound in love to one another. We got to love one another. And look at what he says. He takes it a step further. And he says, and to all, just as we do to you. First of all, he deals with the fact that the church has to love one another. And then he comes back and says, now, since you're the church, since you're a Christian, since you love the Lord, since you say you love the Lord, you ought to have love for all people. You, it ought to hurt your heart to hear a mass shooting where nine people dies, where others are hurting, where nine people die and others are hurt. It, it, ought to be, it ought to be hurting your heart today to know that one man can take eight out and then take himself out. You are just as madly in love with the man that shot them as you are with the ones that were victimized. Because at the end of the day, there are nine families in pain. There are others who are wounded. We ought to not only love those of us in the church, <laughs> but we ought to love all. Paul says, I'm praying that love abound for one another, to you for one another, and to you for all. I want, I want God to bring us to a point in this nation where we love all. And I'm the first to admit, it's hard to love some people. It's hard to love people when they do you wrong. It's hard to love people who keep pushing you and persecuting you and bad-mouthing and backstabbing you. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. So he says, love all. Those who look like you, love them. Those who don't look like you, love them. Those who have, have mixed up badges, love them. One thing about it, love will conquer all. Just love. Love. And some people have to get to a point where they love their children enough to discipline them. Love. Love. Love is not cute all the time. Love doesn't feel good all the time. Sometimes love makes you wonder, do that person love you? We ought to get to a point where we not only love the saints of the church, but we love all mankind. And then Paul says, just as we do to you. The irony here is there are some people in the church that Paul is talking to that he's having to remind them that we love you. Now you need to go out and love others. You got to go and love people. You got to go and love people and, and have this, this increase in your love. Love you to love others to the point that they know you love them. This love is brotherly love. It's affection for the brethren. It is, it is brotherly love. It is love that we have, but it is also agape love. It's unconditional love. It is a love that we have for each other that's unconditional. I mean, regardless of what I've seen you do, I, I still love you. Paul says, I'm praying that we can get together. I'm praying that God increases your love, that it will abound and superabound uh, for each other. Then that you will always love other people other than yourselves. And not only will you love yourself, and as a congregation, but you will also love those who are not members of your congregation. Verse 13, he says, so that he may establish your hearts blamelessly. So that he may establish, this word establish is also establish. So that he will set fast your heart. So that he will strengthen your heart. So that he will confirm your heart. If you really want to know a person, get to know their hearts. He may mess up. He may do something wrong. He may say something negative. He may say something that makes you mad. But what is really in his heart? A lot of pastors would still be pastoring churches 
if the members only knew that even though he messed up, he has a good heart. It's in your heart. A lot of marriages would still be marriages if the spouses knew that the other spouse had the good in the heart. A lot of friends would still be friends. Even though I messed up, even though I fought, fell short, we would still be friends if you only knew what was really in my heart. If you only knew what my resolve was. If you only knew what my stance was. Paul says, so that he may establish you, may establish you. He may establish you. He may set you fast. That he may establish you. Your heart. And what he want to establish in your heart, he wants you to be blameless. Make your hearts blameless, faultless. Make, make your heart. Now, you may do some faults. You may have some faults, but your heart is faultless, irreproachable. Your, your, heart, your heart is free from defect. You see, the, the spiritual heart this word heart is your innermost being. This word heart is your thoughts. This word heart mean, means that, that your, your mannerism is dictated by what you feel and what you think on the inside. Your heart must be blameless, faultless. He, he's praying that you become faultless. I believe every pastor ought to pray that the people become blameless, faultless. And I believe that every people... Every group of people, every person, all persons ought to be praying that the pastor <laughs> become faultless or blameless. And that you be blameless in holiness, that your morale is right, that, 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 that you have the right morals. I said to, to the group uh, the other day that there are three kids on the block now. It used to be two. Now there are three kids on the block. There's morality, meaning that we're going to do what's right. There's immorality, meaning that we're going to do what's wrong. But now there's amorality. Mm -hmm. Amorality is that I get to dictate what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. That means that we don't have God as our standard. Every day of the week, we change like the wind and whatever makes us happy. But Paul says, in your holiness, we want you to be blameless. This word holiness, in your holiness is, is, is your, your purity. Your holiness is your, your, your decent morality. You ought to have some de decent morals in your life. There are just some things you ought not do. <laughs> there are some things that people who know you and they hear that you've done it, those people ought to say, they got the wrong guy there. Oh, that's the wrong girl. She doesn't do that kind of thing. It's because you have morals. In your family, your friends, your associates, your neighbors, they know that those things that they say you have done, they know that that's not a part of your, your makeup. Your morals won't let you do that. Your morals won't let you say that. You have to make sure that you walk in holiness, that you walk in sacredness. This word holiness is sacredness. This word holiness is purity. This word holiness doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes, but it means that you, your character is one of holiness. And let me just share with you, ladies. Not wearing makeup doesn't make you holy. Right. Wearing dresses below your knees don't make you holy. In the reverse is that's true also. Just because you wear a dress above your knees doesn't make you unholy. Holiness is in the heart. Holiness is in your morals. Holiness is what you do when no one else is looking. You got integrity. God wants us to walk in holiness. He says, says to us tonight, so that, that he 
may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What he's saying to us is, we're going to have to stand before the great judge. We're going to have to stand before God for the deeds that are done in this life. You're going to have to answer to God. God is our judge. God is the one with the last word. If we are saved, we ought to act like we're saved. If we are saved, we ought not be carnal-minded. The word carnal mind, it means that, that I, I'm saved, know that I'm, I am, but for some reason or the other, I act like the world. When I first came to Houston, there was a, there was a, a, a club, and they, they call it a Christian club. So I wanted to go check the Christian club out. I've never been to a Christian club. <laughs> and when I got to the Christian club, it looked just like Club Ebony. They had the lights going like Club Ebony. When I got to the Christian club, it, it looks just like Maxwell. When I got to the Christian club, it looked just like the Streaming Eagle. When I got to the Christian club, it looked just like Grammys. They called it a Christian club. They had the lights that looked alike. They played the music that sounded alike. They had the darkness and the lights dim just like. Let me tell you, Christian, we have to walk in holiness where people can see a difference in us than they see in them. Because the same people that talk about you being too holy today, when things go wrong in their life, they're going to look for your holiness. The same people that said didn't take all that churching, didn't take all that Bible study, the same people that walk away when you talk about Jesus, when trouble strikes, they're going to need you. And they can't come to you if you're just like them. So Paul says to this church at Thessalonica, as I say to you today, whatever you do, don't let people pull you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back. Look at what it says. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be blameless before God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. The next chapter is going to further explain how Jesus is coming back with his saints. We've heard it at funerals. Jesus is coming back at the trump of God at the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We say that at funerals because we want the family to believe that the deceased have gone on to be with the Lord. And one of these days, at the trump of God, that person will rise up to be caught up with the Lord in midair. He says, we need to be blameless. We need to be holy. We need to walk with God. And as Jesus presents us before God, before our God, before our Father, at the coming of Jesus Christ, he will bring all the saints with him. Yes, Lord. He will bring with him all the saints. Hallelujah to the Lamb. If you're listening to me today and you are not saved, if you're listening to me and you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can be in this number, and you can fix it right now. If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, whether you are a child or an adult, this is your moment. Jesus is coming back. God is our judge. And as Jesus come back, you need to leave planet Earth with him. Why go through hell and die and go to hell? You can avoid heaven. You can avoid hell and make it to heaven. You can, you can avoid hell. You don't have to go to hell. Hell was made for somebody. Make sure that it wasn't made for you. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Will you come to Jesus? Will you trust him today? The same Jesus that died over 2,000 years ago. 
The same Jesus that, that rose from the dead. The same Jesus that is coming back. And the text declares, before our God, before our Father, at the coming of our Lord, can you call him your Lord? He's coming back. Our Lord is coming back. He's coming to get a church without a spot or wrinkle. This church that Jesus is coming to get back, it, they are born again believers that make up this church. He is coming back to get somebody. He's coming back to get all of us who are saved, who are born again, who has trusted this story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and me. Over 2,000 years ago, they, they killed him on a skull hill called Calvary. Over 2,000 years ago, he had you in mind. Mean men killed this innocent man called Jesus. Historians are willing to say today that over 2,000 years, there existed a man named Jesus. They found his grave but they didn't find his bones because he's not there. He rose from the dead. He got up and caught a cloud, went on back to heaven. Today, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercessions for you and me. I appeal to you today. I beseech you today. I beg you today. Try Jesus. Jesus will make it possible for you to join those saints in heaven. And if you die before he comes back, the text of class, the last verse, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the verse 13 says that he will bring the saints back with him. He's going to talk more about it in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 but don't you want to be in that number you can be in that number today but you got to trust Jesus will you join me in prayer and invite him into your life it's very simple just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins he was buried in a borrowed tomb and he rose from the dead and you can be saved right here, right now. Wherever you're sitting, wherever you're standing, wherever you're lying, you can be saved right here, right now. Just join me in prayer. Repeat after me as Paul says, I'm praying for you. Just say these words, Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you pray this prayer, we believe that you're now born again. And if you die today or tonight, we believe that you will go to heaven when you die. There may be others of you who are saved, who are born again. But for some reason or the other, you're not doing it God's way. And Jesus is your Savior but you're not allowing him to be your Lord. You need to allow Jesus to be your Lord. If that's you today and you're not allowing him to be your controller, you're not allowing him to be your guide, you're saved and you know you're going to heaven, but for some reason or the other, you just 
You're still tinkling with the devil. I want to pray with you and pray for you. If you are struggling like I do, if you are struggling like I am with sin, I want to pray with you. Matter of fact, I want to pray with us. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you now. I bless your name. Thank you for those who are humbling themselves today. Who have decided to follow you. We pray now for recommitment. We pray for refocus. We pray for redirection. We pray for repentance. We pray for rededication. Lord, we pray that you accept us and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. There may be others of you who are in between church homes or do not have a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Great church doing great things to a great God and glorifying our God in Southeast, Southeast Houston, Texas. You don't have to be in Houston to be a part of our church. You can join by inboxing me and let me know you wanna be a part of the New Beginning Church. I send you all the proper documentation so you can be a part of the New Beginning Church. So you can be a part of this family of faith where the word of God is being taught and preached uncompromisingly. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for being with us as we have come today to lift the name Jesus. Next week, we'll be moving to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll be talking about a plea for purity. Apostle Paul pleads for purity. Join us next week as we come to talk about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. God bless you and God keep you. It is offering time. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Don't wait till Sunday to give. Give right now. Bring it unto the Lord. Bless the name of Jesus by giving. Give it unto the Lord. You can give. You can give by uh, three means. First of all, when you worship with us, you can give in your offering basket by way of an envelope. Or you can mail your envelope into New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is as we lift Jesus, Jesus draw all men unto himself. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Thank you again for joining us for Bible study tonight. We'll be here every Wednesday night at 7 15 p.m. 7 15 p.m. or every Wednesday night. Please join us on Sunday morning for Sunday school at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. every Sunday morning for Sunday school. And please, ma'am, please, sir, join us on Sunday morning for our worship service at 1030 a.m. We're back in church. Please come and visit with us. Please come and be a part. And not only that, if you can't make it to the house, go ahead and join us on this station and in many other stations. And, and look at our website at NBCSouls.org, NBCSouls.org, and you get all our past messages for the last few years. Join us here at the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad you have come to worship with us, and you'll be glad that you have come to worship with us. I want to remind all students that your report cards are due. Your report cards are due. 
your report cards are due. Please bring in your report cards. And, and those of you who are celebrating a graduation, please send in uh, where you're graduating from, where you're headed to, and what you're looking to do with your life. Uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, I need your report cards and I need your graduation. We want to celebrate with you. This year, 2021, I get the privilege of graduating with the 2020 class, 2021 class, and I'm glad about it. So I want to graduate with you and I want to celebrate with you this year as we do every year. COVID-19 has put a, a damper on a lot of things, but we want to celebrate your graduation for sure. We want to lift Jesus Christ and praise him for what he has done in your life. So let us know if you're graduating. Please turn in your report cards. We want to make sure that we know what you've done all year long. I know it's been a tough year in school, but God has been gracious to us. He has blessed us. We we'll couldn't continue to pray for Miss Katie uh, Smith, uh, the mother of Brother Aaron Williams in Mississippi. We are praying for Miss Katie Smith. We are praying for Miss Mary Williams and her family. We're praying for Mary Williams' family, rather. We're praying for Mary Williams' family, who's also uh, uh, originally from Mississippi. We're praying for Miss Ivy Warner in here, here in Houston, Texas. She's 98 years old. She's sick. We need prayer for her. We need you to be praying for her. Amen. So let's continue to pray for these and many others as we close out tonight. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for keeping our children. We thank you for keeping them safe to and from school. We thank you for keeping them safe at home. We thank you, Lord, and we glorify you, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray for those whose names we've called. We ask you to bless, heal, touch, give bereavement, give comfort during the, this bereavement period for those who are going through. We ask you to bless us, Father God, and keep us. This is our prayer. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by singing amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank you for joining us.